Good day, everybody. I am Marcella Oliva, architecture professor for Los Angeles Trade Technical College. It's one of the nine community colleges in Los Angeles County. We are here super excited as part of Paul Revere Williams Day on Saturday, April 2, 2022. It's a one yearly event that connects professionals, students across multiple experiences, backgrounds, parents, educator, most prestigious architecture firms. And we're here to celebrate our, uh, uh, a new thinking or more than anything, accepting uh, uh, a new reality that actually makes us better participants for the survival of our cities and our ecological movement. I'm also board member for the United States Green Building Council. And I have with us a super special person. We couldn't go and leave this day without hearing from Karen Hudson. She's been an amazing uh, person to carry the legacy of one of the most important architects in our country, our city, because he was able to bring beauty to all multiple types of buildings that you guys heard through the days. And with not too much more to say, let me ask a few questions to Karen Hansen. So Karen, could you tell us a little bit about you? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I don't know if very, very many people know this, but my grandfather went to Los Angeles Polytechnic High School, which is on the site of where Trey Tech is now. So his spirit is there with you. His spirit is where, there with you. So um, my name is Karen Elise Hudson. I am the granddaughter of Paul Williams, one of his two granddaughters, and his official biographer. So I've actually spent a little more than 30 years looking at his life and work. As a grandfather, he was probably a better grandfather than he was architect, if you can believe that. And as a child, he had the best toys and he brought them to us. And the reason he, I think that happened is because he was orphaned by the time he was four. So family was very important to him. And my brother, Paul, who is his namesake, and I were the only two grandchildren for almost 10 years. Spoiled doesn't even begin to uh, talk about <laughs> our relationship with our grandfather. But for me, you know, I've written three books on him. I'm writing, I'm working on two now. One that's a um, young adult graphic bio and uh, one that actually speaks about my two grandfathers and Paul Williams as a man. And one of the reasons I was so interested in writing about him is because he had long told us that he wanted to write a book and he became ill before he was able to do it. You know, when you do 3000 projects around the world, you don't have a lot of extra time to write books. <laughs> and so by the time he retired, he was ill and his, his eyesight was failing and he couldn't do it. But he always said the reason he wanted to write about his life was not because he thought he was so much special, more special than anyone else, but because he wanted to inspire young people and particularly people of color, not just to be architects, but to be use their imagination for creative problem solving, whatever they did, and to understand the importance of excellence. So he couldn't do it, so I've done it and I'm just, you know, thrilled to, to share what I have with you. Thank you so much, Karen. And we are so excited and we're looking forward to make this book available to all these youth that they can see the power of design. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, and just to be political correct, do you think we have black architecture? Could we say something right now is very popular in the media to say that or a little bit? I wonder if the people in the media who are saying it are black. Um, I try to make decisions and try to adapt my thought about architecture because I'm not an architect. You know, I'm a historian of my grandfather and his work, but I don't think he'd be happy to say that his architecture was black architecture because what does that mean? I mean, does that mean, and someone asked me years ago if he did black architecture and I'm like, so what does that mean? He's He's doing low-income housing. Does it mean that he's doing um, things that have red, black, and green on them? I mean, what is black architecture? Just good design is good design. And 
you know, he was primarily a residential architect, although he did everything. And he always said he designed homes, not houses, because they were for families. And he always used to say, if you look at an, a magazine from 40 years ago that had one of his designs or someone else's designs, and 40 years later, you can look at it and still say it's a good design, then that's something about your value as an architect and your value as a designer. I think if someone said, well, this is black architecture, and I have no idea what that means. Um, 40 years from now, what are you gonna look at? What are you gonna say? Is that a trend today? Or is that the stability of what good design is in our country and around the world? Absolutely. I'm, I'm so happy you clarified that. And it's important for our students to, to see that distinction. Good architecture is good architecture. Good doesn't, need to good be, doesn't need to be stigmatized. Absolutely. And if you do it for a particular client, you want to believe that subsequent owners and subsequent residents and subsequent people who work in buildings are going to be just as happy as that original owner was. Absolutely. And good architecture is like you go and see a good concert. You, you don't care that architecture unites us. And right. you don't see color races. You just look and listen to the beautiful music and see the beautiful architecture. But and don't get me wrong. I want, them to, I want journalists and people to celebrate architects of color. Of course. But that does not mean that. I mean, there's something that's a stigma. When you say Black architecture, as though somebody else reading it around the world is going to think that there's something less than regular architecture. That's Perfect. not okay. I appreciate the distinction. Thank you so much. And uh, you start talking a little bit about it, uh, but we do need to make sure we have more people of color in the profession. Okay, you talk about it a little bit. Why is so, it important that we do that? Well, next year marks 100 years since Paul Williams became the first member of the American Institute of Architects, the AIA. And it is frightening that 99 years later, there are still less than 2% members of, color, of African American members of the AIA. It's frightening to me because certainly when he became a member, it was an old boys club, you know, white boys only know women, you know, no people of color. And when you start excluding people of color and women, you're excluding a very significant um, soul and heart and design theory that people from various cultures can bring to something. For instance, if you're designing you know, a hospital or, or a library or something in one community versus another community, or for, for example, design, um, Destination Crenshaw, if you don't have people of color involved, then you're not speaking to the community. And that may mean that, you know, the same way you do with um, people who are disabled, you're not gonna build something that's not gonna make them feel comfortable when they're there or somebody who's blind that doesn't have access to seeing something. The same thing is true when you talk about people of color who may live in an environment where they don't have grocery stores, you know, within walking distance. They don't have adequate schools, they don't have, um, libraries that stay open past noon or something that someone can actually use. And so for that reason, anybody of color, and women I say, not only because there's so few in the AIA, but because we bring a strength and a gentleness to design. We think of things that men don't think of. Forgive me, I'm not an architect, but that's true for all projects. That's, exactly. all, that's true for all projects. And they bring the family, into it. So when you look at um, why we need more people of color, we need more people of color because we want to be representative of what our country represents. Beautiful. We've been here a long time. And we have certainly added to not only the design, but the culture and the history of Los Angeles, of California, of the United States, and of the world. And so why shouldn't we be in a position to be able to do that moving forward? Very nicely said, absolutely. And two more questions. One is, uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit how the Getty is supporting the legacy of such important architect and why it's so important? Well, in 19, um, 19, 
until I'm old, right? In 2020 and 21, um, University of Southern California, USC, and the Getty Research Institute combined with their new African American initiative in arts and culture acquired the Paul Williams papers. And this was exciting for us. Number one, Getty has such a reputation worldwide because the, the collection is actually housed at the Getty, not at USC. They are so well known as a research institute, but it also, once they catalog everything, it's gonna be open to the public. People can not only um, scholars, but individuals who, who wanna see old designs or wanna see the moldings that he did or something like that or in a position to view them. So the Getty is very important for that reason. And they are participating. There's never been a major exhibition on Paul Williams work. And the Getty along with USC and LACMA are planning to do such an event. Beautiful. And that brings me to the last question. I so appreciate Architecture for Communities Los Angeles, AIA, ACLA. And so I appreciate the, the Paul Revere Williams Day because I just think it's extremely important that when we provide something to the community, it is at a professional level and is well organized. And he has the same respect then to the architecture at large and the importance of not lowering the standards for our communities. Maybe you can say a few words about it because I see a lot of events that don't, don't, don't maintain that professionalism that we need to bring to our communities and how important that is? Well, for one, people underestimate our community. They underestimate the creativity in our community. They underestimate the excellence, the will to follow their dreams. You know, and speaking directly to young people, this is a man who was orphaned by the time he was four. This was a man who was raised by foster mother, who was never adopted. This is a man who was repeatedly told that he could not become an architect because white people would not hire him and black folks couldn't afford to hire him. And so if you just looked at the kind of people who were architects back in the day, now he was born in 1894, downtown Los Angeles. He's a true Angelino. If you look at our architects of the day, they came from well-to-do families. They traveled well, they um, studied abroad to look at different styles. He studied in books that were in his library, in his home, in his office. He, didn't, he was not afforded the opportunity to go abroad until he'd been practicing almost 30 years, you know, 25 years. And so it, it would make him so happy if he was alive today, number one, his office would be very supportive and want to be part of this day. But the fact that he sees young people of all walks of life, of all backgrounds, of all challenges, and he would look and say to each and every one of them, you don't necessarily have to be an architect, but you have to contribute to your community and not be apart from it. And that's our greater community, not just the neighborhood you live in. He would say, read as much as you can, listen more than you talk, and develop a passion that allows you to sort of just give the world that excellence that you're willing to do. People come in, particularly corporations, they'll, they'll throw some money at you, but they won't necessarily give the young people that kind of emotional boost They'll say, oh, this is trade tech. You know, people go there who don't go to Harvard, blah, 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 blah. I, do, I sincerely believe that there are some people at trade tech, some young people who are as talented, if not more talented than the people at Ivy League schools. They just haven't been given the same educational opportunities. And so hopefully we'll get to the point that corporations are investing in that education and, and investing in it long-term. Oh, Not Karen, sure I answered your question, but you totally you did. <laughs> totally you did. Karen, your words are worth gold. Thank you so much to the AIA Architecture for Communities Los Angeles. Thank you, Karen, for carrying this legacy. So important. We are just at its surface. 
our dream is to have all his designs on these metaverse, these new virtual worlds and continue uh, learning from your ideas, from, from your writing, from his legacy. And thank you very much. And you all let have- one, Let me say one more thing. Please do, please do. Just recently last month, the home that was the first home um, my grandparents lived in on 35th near Budlong, near, okay. near USC, mm -hmm. um, was declared a, a local historic cultural monument. And people were saying, well, he didn't design it. You know, why should we be doing this? Once again, he was living in a, rel you know, comparatively inexpensive home, single story home, raising his children, living there with my grandmother. They lived there for, 30 years before he was redlining and he was able to move west and design his own home. But he was living in this home, which other people wouldn't want to touch or near, and they wanted to be a teardown at a time when he was building 12 and 15,000 square foot mansions. Oh, wow. The celebrities. He was building um, hospitals. He was building schools. He was building um, churches. He was participating in his community and never once complaining, keeping a positive attitude. And at one time in 1937, to paraphrase him, he said, today I sketched plans for one of the most you know, beautiful homes and one of the most lavish places in the world. I could afford to live there, but I couldn't because of the laws. And he said wow. that day, he came home to his small, relatively inexperienced home, um, inexpensive home because he was a Negro. So oh. I don't want anybody to ever think where you live, what you do, who your parents were, have anything to do with your ability to be wonderful. That is a very impressive story. I had a very impressive grandfather. Yeah, <laughs> look at that beautiful smile. You remind oh, me so, of some of those images. <laughs> I so appreciate um, your interest in him and your interest in his legacy. Um, it would make him so happy that he was inspiring other people. I almost don't want to finish this conversation. Oh, Hopefully yeah. we can, maybe we can do a <laughs> podcast or we can do something to continue. These are really important conversations and uh, we hope that this is one of many. We're actually planning, we're getting a new studio and we want to call it after his name. So hopefully this is one of many. We're doing some studies about the geometry he used from nature and, and his uh, presence. I think he has the largest uh, uh, footprint in LA. So we're looking forward to working with you and all the students and professionals watching this video. Uh, thank you all. We are moving into a new world and these are really good signs of, of progress as humanity. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Karen. So we're done, right? <laughs>